The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good evening, people. I've, I've placed so much emphasis on Renoir's camera because I think it so uh, fundamentally expresses uh, his sense of experience. And if you become attentive to the really quiet and subtle ways in which Renoir's camera is almost always in action, is a part of the story in some sense, uh, you can begin to capture something of his importance in the history of cinema. Uh, because no director uh, or apprentice director who ever uh, studied or looked at uh, Renoir's films came away from it the same. Uh, and his influence is almost impossible to fully measure. There, 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 are, there are no uh, c cinematic traditions after Renoir that haven't, at least in some degree, even if not directly, then indirectly through other people who have been influenced by him, uh, um, uh, been shaped by Renoir's uh, example. And I wanted to give you one more instance of Renoir's camera. This is from a film I've mentioned but not shown you. It's from the, the last of his great French films. Some people, many people would say it's his greatest film, one of the great masterpieces in the history of movies, The Rules of the Game. The only reason I don't show it in our course is that it's in many ways a more difficult, a more complex film than Grand Illusion. Gra uh, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a grand clarity or simplicity of, of a certain kind, not a simplicity of character or of vision or of theme, but a simplicity of intention that becomes clear at least after the fact in Grand Illusion. It's a more accessible film, especially for Americans, I think. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the rules of the game much more profoundly uh, is a, 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 a meditation on the, a theme that is also present in Grand Illusion, as you'll see this evening, uh, it, it, the theme of historical transition. But it's a much more complex and, and uh, extended meditation on what was happening to French society uh, in, the, in, this, in this immense transition that took place at the beginning of the 20th century. Essentially, it's a transition, as you'll see dramatized in um, the film we're showing tonight, uh, Grand Illusion, it's a, tr it's a transition from an aristocratic to a middle class culture, from, 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 a, from, from, a, from an aristocratic dispensation to a quasi-democratic or more democratic dispensation. Uh, and and uh, this was a topic uh, which, which uh, preoccupied many directors, Renoir especially, and is a kind of central topic in both Rules of the Game and Grand Illusion. And this scene from uh, uh, Rules of the Game is maybe his least subtle in some ways, or rather the subtlety is harder to see if you're just looking at a clip. The subtlety in, in, uh, is involved in the characters themselves, who have already in some degree been established in a kind of individuality, which then further expresses itself in the scene you're going to see. Uh, the basic situation of uh, uh, the Rules of the Game is a is a classically uh, uh, powerful one. Uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it's essentially a weekend of festivities. A, a marquee, a grand figure, uh, 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 presumably uh, who, who owns a, uh, a, a remarkable chateau, invites, a group, many for, invites some friends for a weekend of games and shooting, of, uh, of hunting, uh, at his great chateau in the country. And uh, uh, the, 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 the film is a kind of series of tableau or a series of festivities, all of which are cankered or damaged in some way. It's as if we have a sense that each of the festivities or festivals that are dramatized in the rules of the game are diminished versions of something that in the past had great authority, power, and cultural centrality, but, has, but have become now diminished and even, and even parodically uh, uh, 
reduced versions of what they had been when they were part of a coherent culture. And it's almost as if these festivals and rituals have become, have been rec are recognized by the film, although not necessarily by the characters inside the film, as vestiges of a time that has now passed. And the most dramatic instance of this subject, of the, of the, or the embodiment of this theme, is the scene you're going to see. It's the hunting scene. Uh, and uh, I, 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 don't, I, I want you to sort of at least get a sense of it, not, uh, not only because it's an important film and I'd like to fix it in your mind, maybe give you a taste of it so you'll go out and look at the film yourself. Uh, be, be, these, two, these two films, Grand Illusion and, and uh, Rules of the Game, are certainly the pinnacle of Renoir's art. And people who know these films deeply know something important about film, know something important about what works of art are. So I want you to see it for that reason. But I also want you to see it to get one more experience outside of Grand Illusion of the way Renoir's camera behaves, and especially the way it establishes a relationship between character and, and ground, between character and environment. And here, of course, the camera's job is not only to tell us something about the relations among the characters and to show us their interactions uh, in, in as economically powerful a way as possible, but also to give us a sense of this, of this grand ritual gone bad. Okay. Or freeze it one second. This, the character who, that little character who's giving instructions, you will recognize him. His, his, the actor's name is Dalio, and he's the one who plays Rosenthal in Grand Illusion. In this film, he plays the Marquis. See how powerful it is not to have fake music? What just the effect of that is on the film? I shouldn't say fake music, non-diegetic music, music that's not part of the scene itself. There's Dalio. Freeze it for a second. I wish we had time to dwell on this. And I won't do this too much because I'll run out of time for what I need to tell you. But tell me what you see here quickly. Make some conclusions about what, what about this great ritual? Immediately, what would we think if, we watching, if we're watching this? What's one conclusion you draw from this? Is this, uh, is this, uh, is, is this hunting uh, uh, the, 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 the activity of, of, of brave pioneering souls who are confronting the dangers of the wilderness? Right? It's, it's an unbelievably uh, controlled and, in many ways, murderous environment, isn't it? What have we begun to feel about these, about these creatures that are being flushed out? Tremendous sympathy for them. Right? We're hostile to the adults. Right? We're hostile to the human beings in the scene. We think there's something the matter with this. And of course, it's not in the olden days, in the day, in the, presumably in the days uh, when, when such hunts uh, occurred in a, more, in a more coherent and less, and, and less forced way, you didn't need beaters to go around in the woods making noise to scare the few, re, the few vestiges of rabbits and other game out into the open so people with giant guns could kill them, right? They, because the place was teeming with, in the 16th or the 15th century or the 18th century, the, 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 these fields were teeming 
with game. Now in the 20th century, you have to beat the sticks to get them to come out. <laughs> what a parody of what an actual hunt would be. Go ahead. When this film was made, I forgot the number. I have it in my notes, but I couldn't find them there. I left them in my office. A, a certain number of these animals were actually killed in the, in, the, in, the, in the making of the film. I forgot the number, but it's a significant number. It's a day that when they made such a film, there are rules that don't allow them to kill animals. Okay, you get some sense of how powerful a satirist, but also how quiet a satirist he could be. It's not as if the film, it's not as if there's someone there saying, isn't this horrible? He's leaving it to the audience to figure out, although it doesn't take too much to figure it out, does it? What, what, what you can't pick up from this, it makes maybe the scene that I've shown you may make the scene seem cruder than it is. Virtually all the characters, faces that you've seen, many, most of them anyway, are major characters in the film. And even by this time in the film, you've gotten to know some of them quite well. So they've been humanized and individuated. And that makes the brutality to which they are mostly oblivious of what's happening even more powerful. You don't hate the characters who are doing this shooting. You know them for the comic and, and damaged and ambitious and idealistic and, and foolish characters they've already shown themselves to be by the time they get into this scene. It's almost as if they themselves are also victims of this ritual they're part of. So there's a kind of subtlety that you can't pick up on just watching the clip that, that uh, is present for any, for any audience member. But I wanted you to see the, 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 this scene also in part, again, to show you how powerfully uh, Renoir's camera is able to uh, create emotional and intellectual responses in the audience in a way that is, uh, in some sense, diametrically opposed to what we might call expressionist directors like Hitchcock or Eisenstein might do by manipulating our, our, our attitudes by uh, constant, by very rapid editing and, and by giving us high or low angle shots that control our emotional response because of the way we're seeing things. Uh, uh, Renoir's strategies can be just as powerful in terms of emotional and moral reaction but Renoir's, Renoir's strategy is quite different. Present the evidence, in some sense, to the, to the audience. Keep, keep, the, keep the camera uh, at, at a level that allows the full action to be taken in. I, I hope you realize that there were relatively few cuts in that scene. And in, in most of uh, Renoir's work, the number of edits is relatively small compared to the number of scenes that are extended, the, number, the, uh, the, 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 the amount of long takes that we have. And there are certain moments in the in the film where he will vary this strategy. For example, and you might want to watch for this in tonight's film, there's one moment in tonight's film uh, where uh, a, 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 an interview between two of the central characters, the, the German prison warden, uh, 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 played by Eric von Stroheim, uh, and uh, the, 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 the French aristocrat, um, named Du Bois Dieu, played by an actor named De Fresnay, De Fresnay. And, and uh, uh, in this scene between the German and the Frenchman, one of the things we recognize is because they belong to the aristocratic class, they have a lot in common. 
what, they speak English, for example, they, because they both know English, right? Even though one's a German and one's a Frenchman. And there is a sense in the film, of a very powerful one that's established, that they have, in, in some sense, a greater connection to each other than they have with their own, uh, 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 with other soldiers of, of, in, in their own armies. Uh, and the film, is, the film meditates on these distinctions, and especially on this uh, conundrum of social class, in rather a complex way, as, I, as I'll suggest. Well, in the very first scene between um, uh, uh, Boisdieu and Raufenstein, the German and the Frenchman, uh, um, Renoir uses a fairly standard procedure, much more common to other directors. It's sometimes called a shot counter shot style, so that when you're, it's especially common on American television, but it was it's common in the movies too, in which when you see characters in conversation, uh, you'll get relatively rapid cutting, and you'll look at one face, then then the camera will shift, and you'll look back at the other face. There'll be a cut, and you'll look at right, and you you'll constantly shift back and forth this shot counter shot style. Uh, but he Renoir uses this kind of style rarely because it involves, uh, the first of all, it involves the idea of cutting. It involves the idea of separation. Why use shot counter shot, Renoir would say, when I can move my camera like this and show the two characters together and move it, and move it around in another way and show the back of one character's head and the way the other is real. In other words, if the, camera, if the camera's part of the action, a fluid part of the action, there's more, I can show you more about character, Renoir would say. But in that particular scene, he doesn't do it. In this first interview, extended interview, it lasts about two minutes and 45 seconds, and it uses 21 shots, 21 separate shots in two minutes and 45 seconds. For Renoir, that's a tremendous number of edits, right? And one way you can tell that this is a, and what, what, why would he do it there? Because he, it's very unusual for him to use this shot counter shot style in the film. Why would he do it? He wants to emphasize their separation, their isolation from each other, their distance from each other. Right? And, it, and there is a later scene in the film, uh, near the very end of the film, uh, again between Du Bois Dieu and, uh, 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 and another character, uh, but this one between Du Bois Dieu and Maréchal, the French working man, who, working class figure who's, who's on the French side, just before there's an attempted escape. And that scene is almost as long. It's two minutes and, tw uh, and 20 seconds long, but that scene only has three separate edits in it. And you might compare it. The farewell scene is a very obvious one, and you'll, you'll recognize it when you see it. And, and, and of course, the reason is that he wants to emphasize, insofar as it's possible, that they are together. He wants to minimize the sense of isolation uh, in that sequence. Again, I mention this because I want you to become as attentive as possible, without destroying your enjoyment of the film, to the camera's way of behaving. Uh, so uh, one of the ways, to summarize what I'm trying to say about the way the camera works in Renoir, I want to remind you that even in his darkest films, uh, um, the, his, his camera work carries an undercurrent of excitement, even sometimes a kind of joy at the sheer particularness, the particularity of the world. Um, uh, the, uh, you, can, you can sense his, his awareness of, ambigu of human ambiguity and his wonder at the texture of the visible world, uh, all through his films of the French, uh, of his, uh, of, of his so-called French period, and especially in the film you're going to see tonight, which is in many ways in environments that are very un poetic, right? The, the entire film takes place in a series of prison camps. The entire film is about these French prisoners of war. There's an introduction or prologue before they're captured, and then after they're captured, we see them in a series of prison camps. Uh, um, and and uh, uh, it's a, quite an amazing uh, uh, experience in some ways to watch Renoir's camera discover the complexity of even the... Uh, of, 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 a, of, 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 a, of a world that seems in, on the surface to be so unpromising. Uh, and so uninteresting, so lacking in texture. Uh, we, we, can think of, uh, we can think of Renoir's camera as shy, timid in a sense, capable of embarrassment even. There's one moment in the rules of the game which partly involves a, a, a kind of, it has a farce dimension, so that there were, when, the, when all the guests in the great estate or castle uh, go to sleep at night, they, they're, there's a, they're, they sort of come out of their rooms and start you know, changing bed partners and things like that. You know, they, they have various liaisons. And there's a moment when the camera is in the, this long hallway and one of the lovers comes out to meet another lover and the, it looks as if the camera actually backs away in a 
embarrassment and looks away as if it says, oh, that, that's inappropriate for me to be looking at. So there's a, the camera is humanized in a very uh, uh, subtle, quiet way all the way through Renoir's uh, uh, work. Uh, so we can think of his camera as shy, as em uh, embarrassed, reluctant to overhear or to intrude. Um, there are even moments when it is distracted or drawn to an apparently irrelevant element. Uh, times when the camera hesitates or even appears to change its mind. An uncertain camera then, always adjusting to a world that is itself always shifting and changing. And of course, that's the deepest argument for why this, the camera is so restless. I mean, remember, it's not obtrusive. It's not like you feel the camera swinging wildly, not at all. You have to pay attention. Sometimes you won't even be aware of the fact of how quietly and subtly the camera, but it's as if the camera is always making adjustments, as if it's always alive to the changing character of what it's looking at. And that very aliveness reminds you of how complex reality is, because reality itself is always shifting and changing. Um, um, uh, this describes, I think, something of what is meant by Renoir's realism. But there's a kind of lyric element, as I've mentioned, a kind of, even a kind of tranquility or pleasure or joy celebratory impulse in his camera's gaze that qualifies or sweetens his realism of space and character, and we need to be aware of that too. One way to crystallize this is to suggest that once we become attuned to the camera's forms of attention, that's a good phrase, the camera's forms of attention. Uh, there's a wonderful book about poetry called Forms of Attention, right? Lyric poetry is, uh, constitutes a special kind of attention. We can say that, that Renoir's camera is, is engaged constantly in these forms of attention. Um, um, once we become aware of that, of that, of the camera's interest in that, uh, we become aware of a quiet, continuous struggle, a loving contest almost, between the multiple points of interest in the scene and the camera's reluctant, gently hesitant choices. The menu of things to see and hear, Renoir's films keep telling us, is too rich to be fully captured, even by the most generous eye. And that's what I mean when I say that visual style can be understood as a form of moral style, right? Uh, I want to say a few more words about uh, Grand Illusion itself to help frame your uh, experience of it. Uh, it's not a complex film, but it's a deep and beautiful one, and I think you'll all find it very memorable. First, a word about the actors. Um, um, or, or maybe I should say one other word about, uh, about Renoir himself, because it bears on his actors. As I implied, or I think suggested this afternoon, one of the most distinctive features of Renoir's practice, and follows, if you think about the way his camera behaves, you can see how logically connected these elements are, was that he was an improvisational director. He collaborated with his actors, with his performers. He didn't come in with an absolutely fixed script. You know, he's, a, a, he's like the anti-Hitchcock. Hitchcock has solved all his problems before he's come in to do his shooting. Renoir has just begun the process of making his movie when he, he has an idea of his subject matter. He knows what he's doing. He knows he, I don't mean that he's working completely blind, but he allows discovery to take place in the course of the making of the movies, uh, of his movies, and he's very deeply involved in collaborating with his performers. So that, for example, um, when he had already begun working on the movie, uh, uh, I, I don't think they, they hadn't begun, sh I don't think they'd begun shooting it yet, but they were very far along in creating the movie and in casting the movie when they discovered that Eric von Stroheim, who was old, already by then, by the time uh, this film was made, a very well-known actor and director, much, in fact, an incredibly admired director, uh, both, a, both, both an actor and a director, uh, 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 agreed to join the film. And when he agreed to join the film, he and Renoir began to collaborate on expanding the role that von Stroheim plays. And you'll understand what an, what, what an immensely helpful contribution to the, what, what could we call it, to the ecology of the movie, to the sense of the movie uh, uh, von Stroheim made because, his, because he's one of the dominant characters. His, his, if, if, we, if, we, if we try to imagine Grand Illusion with a much reduced role for the von Stroheim character, it's a much lesser film.
you can, so you can recognize what an, and, uh, what an extraordinary contribution von Stroheim made. Now, he not only made contributions to questions about the dialogue, what the character would say, expanded the role, but even made suggestions about how the character would look, what, 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 uh, co how the character would be costumed. And I think it was von Stroheim who emphasized, who, who, who emphasized even more fully than Renoir had originally intended that the von Stroheim character is a war casualty, that he has a ramrod up his back, that he, can, he has to wear gloves because his hands are horribly burned. He's a cripple, and that's why he's now running prison camps, because he's not useful for anything else, right? And there's this sense that he's a damaged, uh, 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 um, wounded figure, even from the very beginning of the film when we, when, when we first meet him. Uh, but one, so that's important in itself. But there's a second thing about von Stroheim that I want to emphasize to you. So it shows you how uh, subtly Renoir was a, a, aware of how he could utilize all the elements available to him as a filmmaker. Uh, von Stroheim was especially well known as an actor for roles in which he would play, this was especially true in roles he played in the United States, in which he would play a dangerous, scary martinet, a kind of, a kind of, uh, uh, there, there were even hints of sadomasochism about the role sometimes. So he would play, he would play uh, uh, brutal, uh, brutal prison camp uh, wardens, right, or brutal police types, brutal br militarist types, right, uh, violent husbands, right. Uh, he became, and, and, and in fact, he, w he was understood also as a villain. He often played roles that were recognized recognizably evil roles. He came to be known as the man you love to hate. That was like his sort of, <laughs> he, uh, it was a, a sort of motto that was attached to his, to his name. And when you watch Grand Illusion, one of the things I hope you'll think about is the, compl the, the complex way in which that inherited idea of the von Stroheim character is complicated, undermined, and humanized. Because in many ways, he still is the villain in the piece. But he's a humanized villain. He's a he becomes a complex character, as much a victim of what's happening, uh, of, of hist as much a victim of history as any of the other characters in the film. So uh, th there's a sense in which this, uh, in which what what, what uh, Renoir and von Stroheim together are doing is taking the persona that von Stroheim had established and undercutting it, undermining it in some in some slight way, creating a much greater resonance for the character exactly because of the ways in which he first at appears to fulfill the expectations that he's an evil villain, and then as the film goes on, the sense is undermined, complicated, and you realize that he's a, uh, a, he's a human being with, 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 with powers of generosity, although also certain limitations. Uh, he's, he, he's a German, he's a prejudiced, he, has, he, he doesn't really like the French, especially doesn't like working class people, most especially doesn't like Jews. Right? I mean, it's not, he's an imperfect character, but you see that he's deeply humanized. And something of the same kind of thing happens in the film's treatment of the Jean Gabin character. The, the really, he, he's the character who plays Maréchal, uh, he, the actor who plays Maréchal, the working class uh, um, uh, Frenchman, who, along with Dubois-Dieu and, and uh, the uh, the Jew played by da the, the Jew played by Dalio, uh, 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 a character called Rosenthal. These three are the central uh, French characters, and we see them moving from prison camp to prison camp through the film. It, it, that, gr that group is the central uh, group of the film, and we follow them as the film goes on. Uh, the Gabin character too was, the, in many ways, the most famous actor, of, of, if not in Europe, certainly in France, of the late twenties and thirties. A major, major figure. Uh, and he, he was especially associated with working class roles, and most especially associated with roles, he was like an early Jack Nicholson, an even more powerful version of it, because he became famous for these moments in the films when he would go nuts, when he would have a fit, when he would start screaming or he would lose it. Right? He would he would rant or rave or and, and and in some of the films in some films he was in he would have a, a climactic scene. This may be in fact where the uh, uh, stereotype began. He would have a climactic scene. Often he was a, like he would be a suicidal proletarian, right? A suicidal worker up against the forces of capitalism or the forces of the police, right? The Gabin character had frequent roles like this, uh, in which he would in which he would uh, uh, es essentially lo lose all. Rational control and rant and rave and scream, sometimes die, right? Uh, and he, he was so famous for this, and this was such a fundamental part of his persona, that he uh, had written into most of his contracts that he had to have a scene in which he did this. He had to have at least one scene in the film in which he sort of went cucamonga, 
in which he, in which he lost it, right? Now, uh, one of the most subtle things about this film is there is a, such a moment in this film, watch for it, you may, because it's so quiet compared to what you might expect that you might miss it, but it's really there. And in fact, the way in which it both fulfills but also undermines our expectations about this character, again, tells us something about the way in which Renoir and his collaborating actors were able to create immensely nuanced meanings, uh, uh, possibilities, out of the raw material of their, of, of not only of the story of the film and of the setting of the film, but even the past history of the performers. I want to say just a couple of things about some of the dominant um, uh, themes in the film to help uh, organize your experience of it. And I'm borrowing here, uh, or deeply influenced here, by two critics especially, although I mean, I, 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 perhaps I should say parenthetically, uh, you should probably uh, uh, assume that almost anything I say has been said by someone else somewhere, some, at some time in the past. In other words, the job of a teacher, as I conceive it, is not to come up with totally original arguments every time, because no one can be so original as to say everything that's wonderful about particular texts or about a whole phenomenon like the movies, right? So a good teacher draws on that. And I, 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 when I really am drawing on a, uh, on a prior scholar who I know has uh, shaped the arguments I'm making, or has given me the, the categories I'm using, I mention them by name. But of course, I've been teaching for so long that much of this must now be uh, uh, and unconsciously absorbed into my, into my psyche, and I don't always know this. So I, I'm not saying that those moments where I haven't made this acknowledgment are free of such influence, quite the opposite. But I do want to mention two scholars who have especially influenced me on on uh, Renoir, uh, because virtually all the things I've told you about Renoir, although I've made the ideas my own, come from these. One is a, 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 a Frenchman named Alexander Sassonsky, uh, and uh, wrote a wonderful book on, on uh, uh, I think it's several volume book on, on Renoir, that taught me a tremendous amount, uh, especially about his French uh, period. And the other is the, uh, is the uh, uh, California scholar, now California scholar Leo Brody, one of whose essays I've asked you to read in this course, and he's written a wonderful book on Renoir. Uh, and uh, although I have read the book, I learned more about Renoir from Brody in conversation because he was my colleague many years ago when we were teaching together in the English department at Yale. And he's one of the people who turned me into a person interested in movies, interested in film. So Leo Brody, B-R-A-U-D-Y, Alexander Sassonsky, S-E-S-O-N-S-K-E, -E, the two principal scholars and critics behind what I've been saying both this afternoon and this evening. Dominant themes. One, the prison camp as a microcosm. Right? Uh, there's a wonderful passage at one point in the, in the movie where one of the characters said, everyone would die of the disease of his class if the war did not reconcile all microbes. And think about the implications of that. In other words, the idea is that what the, what, one of the things that makes this prison camp such a fascinating place is that it is, in some sense, a microcosm of the larger world. And, and in fa especially if you, if you think of the prison camp uh, beyond just the, the, the uh, uh, grouping of the French soldiers, whom, uh, the French prisoners whom we follow primarily, what you can recognize is if you back away, because we, we are told about and we meet and we see briefly some of the other prisoners. There are, there are uh, Russian prisoners and uh, other kinds of prisoners as well. There's uh, other kinds of prisoners as well. There's a, there's a sense that, that, that the prison camp is a kind of microcosm, at least of Europe, if not of, if not of the world as a whole. And more specifically, the way in which the prison camp is a microcosm for the social striations that organize outer society. There's a working class, there's a, there's a, seems to be a middle class. You'll notice that there's a scholar who, right, who, who, who has a, a copy of Pindar, the, 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 the great ancient uh, uh, poet, uh, who, think, uh, and who, who, who treasures his work on Pindar. He's one of my favorite minor characters in the film because of his commitment to literature despite the war and despite the miseries of prison camp. Right? Uh, uh, and and what, you, what you can see is, in a certain sense, is that Renoir is delighted by the idea that a, that a, that a kind of microcosm is created. And w uh, if you watch the variations amongst the Frenchmen, and again, if you think about that fragment of a scene I showed you this afternoon of these characters at dinner table in the, in, uh, in the uh, 
in the prison camp, you'll begin to see more fully how powerfully and interestingly, complexly, he differentiates his characters from each other. Uh, uh, that fragment that you saw, I hope you realized one of the characters was an actor. And you could tell that. You, it becomes clearer if you watch the whole scene. But he's a, he's a very histrionic and theatrical character. He bursts into song all the time, right? Uh, and then there's the aristocrat who's looking down his monocle very, very uh, 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 austerely. And uh, it seems to, his lip seems in, uh, curled in a permanent uh, um, gesture of condescension, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, watch how, how, how richly, how complexly the characters are distinguished from each other by social class, by profession, by, uh, and, so, and so forth. I don't want to romanticize or idealize what I'm this argument, because I'm not suggesting that when he says it's a microcosm of the world, he wants to celebrate that microcosm, although he, he's interested in it. Uh, uh, Renoir is also aware of the limitations. that It's not as if he's suggesting that this is a perfect community at all. For one reason is they're forced together, but they're being forced together uh, uh, makes them share, forces them to come out of their limitations in certain way, to overcome certain of their prejudices, although not, never fully, right? But what it also does is reveal them. And we can, and we can see how both processes, the, 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 the process of sort of adjusting uh, to people different from yourself and maybe overcoming some of your class or racial prejudices uh, is a part of the experience that the characters in the film have. But another part of the experience is that they come up against the differences between them, some of which can never be breached. Let me mention one scene which dramatizes this ambig ambiguity very deeply. There's one moment in the film, very powerful moment, I think, uh, in which one in which the, mar the, the character played by uh, 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 Gabin, the Marechal character, is wounded in a good part of the early part of the film. And, and, and in fact, in, in the dinner scene that I showed you this afternoon, uh, you'll see that at a certain point, his comrade sitting at the table cuts his meat for him because his hand is injured. And uh, I don't know if it's in this scene or a subsequent scene. There's a moment when another character in the film washes Marichelle's feet. Why is foot washing a, a instantly a symbolic thing? Who knows the answer? All right. There's a scene in the Bible in 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 the twelfth chapter of John, uh, in which in which in which Mary or Martha, I can't remember which, washes Christ's feet. And then in the very next chapter, and uh, in the very next chapter, it's at the Last Supper, Christ Himself washes the feet of His disciples. And in fact, the washing of feet uh, is is uh, in Catholic and in certain other Christian uh, um, rituals uh, an actual official ritual. It used to be much more common than it is today, but it's still done in certain Catholic uh, countries uh, uh, at the at the advent of the Holy of Holy Week. Uh, uh, at, so it's a deeply symbolic act in which in which Christ Himself is washing the feet of His disciples, and and he and the message He gives is everyone: uh, uh, you should now do this to your to your fellows. Uh, uh, the the implication being no one is better than anyone else. The, the implication a radical a radically democratic vision in some sense of of uh, of God's love. Uh, and uh, where has this practice been recently very dramatically and publicly revived? Who's been doing it? The Pope, the new Pope. Haven't you read about this? The new pope has been doing this. He's uh, 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 washing the feet of parishioners, uh, a, a symbolic gesture in which, in which God's um, emissary on earth is behaving with the humility that Jesus Christ himself. So, so the foot washing scene in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, our film has this sort of resonance to it, even though there's no, there's no openly religious reference. But, of, but it has a similar kind of significance. And, and, and they're carrying on a kind of conversation as the, as the feet are being washed. And what you feel is, boy, what a moving scene. Uh, nobody is embarrassed. Uh, the man who's doing the washing doesn't feel that he's being condescended to or that he's being uh, diminished in any way by doing it. The man whose feet are being washed is not embarrassed to have it happen. What a scene of solidarity and community. Uh, and, and you could turn this, you, you could become very, you could, you could wax very poetic about what a scene of community is. And yet, watch how the scene ends. There's a moment at which after they, as he's drying his feet, uh, the, the, uh, the foot washer, uh, uh, the Marischal asks the foot washer, what do you do for a living? And uh, at some point during their conversation, he says, oh, I, I, he says, I am a, I, 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 I am a cadastre. What that means is something like city planning. He's a city planner. And so the Marichal character hears this, and they go on there. At the very end of the scene, Marichal turns to his foot washer, and he says, what does that mean, cadastre? 
the implication being he, that, that their vocabularies aren't even the same. That, they, that it, what, it, what it dramatizes is the distance between them. He's been sitting there having this conversation with him, but he didn't even say, gee, I have no idea what that word means. I certainly have no idea what you do for a living. It's a way of reminding us, yes, they've come together. Yes, they're sharing space. Yes, they're, they're doing something very uh, um, that dramatizes human solidarity, and yet also how separated they are. Again and again in the film, we have this sort of double experience in which we see characters uh, um, make contact with each other or even sacrifice for each other, and at the same time, we're aware of their differences. Watch for this. It's very powerful and moving. In other words, it's a form of moral realism in which the film refuses to simplify what it wants to say about human experience. A very powerful example of this in the relationship between the Jew, Rosenthal, who's proud of his wealth. He's the heir of a department store fortune, right? Uh, but because he's a Jew he, and, and because he's nouveau riche, he can never be part of the aristocracy. Uh, uh, his relation to the Marischal character is very complex. Marischal, as I mentioned, this afternoon retains a kind of working class, French working class characteristic anti-Semitism. And, and there are moments when you can feel the hostility between them. When the two of them finally try to make an escape from the prison, and they actually are away from one of the prisons for a while, and you see the, the, the Rosenthal character hurts his foot. And there's a moment in which it looks like, gee, if, if the Marichal character stays with him, he's putting himself in danger as well. And they get into a fight. And one of them says, and, one, and Ma the Ma Rosenthal says, go away, leave me alone. Leave. And Marichal says, all right, I will. And the, the, it's a very wonderful scene because they start singing at each other. And it's a form of singing hostility. So there's a comic dimension to it, too. It's really rich. But what is also being dramatized there are the limitations of the characters. Our, our, uh, uh, Marichal's anti-Semitism rises, com comes to the surface. Their hostility toward each other comes to the surface at that moment, although, of course, they also overcome it. And there are many other such moments in the film. Uh, the relationship between Du Boisdieu and his German counterpart, the aristocrat, um, uh, the, um, the aristocratic German uh, uh, is also a version of this, of this kind of thing. So a se as I've already implied, a second central theme of the film has to do with what we might call uh, barriers and boundaries. There's the barrier of social class, which I've mentioned already. There's the barrier of, of uh, language and culture, right? The Germans and the French are at war, right? Uh, the Russians don't speak the same language as the Germans. The English don't speak the same language as the French. And again and again, the, the, what separates people is dramatized for us, although there's also a longing in the field to transcend these boundaries. They, always, they don't, can't always be transcended. Sometimes these boundaries are shown to be foolish and trivial or... or, or at, at, at best, unhelpful, right? Uh, 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 and we can think of many, uh, there are many examples in the film, uh, both of language and of geography, as well as of social class. But let me mention just uh, uh, two of them. There's one wonderful moment in the film. The French prisoners have been digging a tunnel, an escape tunnel. Uh, and they've almost completed the tunnel when the Germans come and say, all right, we're moving you out of your barracks, and we're putting these English prisoners in. It's very deep, and so the French are very unhappy about this because they've almost completed their time. So, at great danger to himself, the Marichal character breaks ranks. Drop, he, try, he, he does a kind of trick where he drops his suitcase, I think, or someone, and he bends over to try to pick it up to give him an excuse to talk to the English prisoners who are going to change places with him. He wants to tell the English prisoners, there's a tunnel, you can escape, right? Uh, but it turns out he's not able to give him the message because the English don't understand French and he can't speak English. So, so the, the English prisoners end up going into them without ever knowing that there's a tunnel waiting for them that's almost ready, ready to be completed. Uh, an example of the barrier that language, uh, the, the, the way language separates people and in many, in many ways can be said to be frustrating. Uh, on one more example, at the very end of the film, there's a moment when the two, the, the two characters, Marischal, and Rosenthal are making their escape across a great field, a great white field of snow. Uh, and they're running across the field, and, so, and the camera backs up, and we see them being watched by German soldiers. One of the soldiers picks up his rifle. He says, they're making an escape, and he starts to aim at him. Then all of a sudden, he stops. I think his, I can't remember the ex watch for the, how it happens. I think his partner says, wait a minute, hold off. Why doesn't he shoot? And then we see Marischal and Rosenthal could disappear across the cross an invisible boundary. And the, and the German says, well, they've crossed the border. <laughs> they're no longer in Germany. I can't shoot them. They're, in, they're now in Belgium. 
But the fact is, there's no boundary there. It's all snow. It's a snowy field, right? How arbitrary that boundary is. Well, again and again in the film, we have this theme of barriers and boundaries, what separates us. Uh, and also, one last thing about the question of social class, maybe the most disturbing and powerful insight that the film has about social class, one that Americans tend to resist, but I encourage you not to resist it, those of you who are not from the United States will perhaps understand this more easily, although Americans need to understand it, is the extent to which one's social class shapes one's identity. That is to say, one of the things we feel in this film is that, well, Jews' nature is a function of his having been raised as an aristocrat. And there are wonderful scenes between Du Bois Dieu and Maréchal, where Maréchal says to him, there's a wall between us. Uh, and uh, you, you're so undemonstrative. And you, <laughs> Marshall doesn't trust him because he, because he, belongs to a, he be, belongs to a different class, even though, of course, they're Frenchmen after all. And in the end, nationality trumps class in this, in this film, uh, as, you'll, as you'll see. Uh, but in this, kind, in this, in this sort of uh, distinction or, or difference between Marshall and Du Bois-Dieu, we have another expression of this, of this sense, of, of, the, of this idea or this recognition that one's personality, it's Self. What one likes and dislikes. One's fundamental nature is in part shaped by the class into which one is born. We're not born utterly free. We don't have absolute choice in what we are or what we become. Our characters are shaped, controlled by the circumstances in which we uh, live. And the film profoundly understands that. It understands our desire to breach those limitations to, to go beyond them, and it celebrates our impulse to do so, but it also recognizes the degree to which we remain confined within personalities that are partly controlled or shaped by forces far beyond our individual control and that are especially located in the social class to which we belong. Finally, as I mentioned this afternoon, the theme of historical transition is at the heart of this remarkable film. And you'll understand very clearly what is going on there. Again, dramatized even more complexly and fully in rules of the game, it's a central topic here. The, an arist, an ar, aristocratic traditions are giving way to modernity in this film. And we're aware of them in all kinds of ways, even in the nostalgic way in which Du, du Bois Dieu and Rolfenstein carry on their conversations. They talk about, they know things, they have, they have experiences in common because they belong to the aristocracy, a, a, a class that transcended in some sense, or at least in part, transcended national origins. That aristocratic dispensation is disappearing. In fact, the First World War completely obliterated it. And Renoir is not the only one who have said this. There are a number of wonderful, uh, 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 apart from scholarship, there are a number of wonderful novels, for example, that deal with this, with the, with the transformation of European society because of the, uh, be because of the First World War. And Renoir's film is is uh, is one such is one such text. Renoir's maturity. This is another way of talking about the complexity or the richness of his films. But I, it's a, I simply want to remind you at the end that one, one way to think about what Renoir is doing is, is to recognize that his, his visual style is, in some sense, an embodiment of the ambition not to simplify, right? to be as fluid and as attentive to the world as it's possible to be, and one can see that that one could say that that visual that 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 commitment to that commitment to the way the camera acts toward the world is a version of a larger kind of uh, maturity or complexity that's revealed in the content of his work as well. Take the characters. I've already mentioned the key point here: the way in which the characters are both flawed, full of weaknesses, but also attractive in certain ways. The way in which Rosenthal is marred by his pride in his family's wealth, uh, the way in which the Gabin character is marred by his anti-Semitism and his lack of education, the way in which the de Boisdieu character is damaged or limited by, the, by, his, by his aristocratic reserve and his impulse toward a kind of condescending superiority which you can see articulated in the very first moment you see him at the very beginning of the film, where he's tisk tisking about the incompetence of his own troops, 
Um, so there's a complexity of character that reflects the maturity of the film's vision of life. And there's a complexity in the story, because think of it for a minute. This is a war story, but it's a war story without battles. Some people have said it's the happiest war story they ever saw. One way of organizing the film is to see it as a series of meals. Uh, in, which, in which characters sit down at a table and share convivial thoughts, right? It's not only, not a sufficient way of thinking about the film, but it's a partial way of thinking about it. So, so although it's a, 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 a film about war, about the consequences of war, it doesn't show shooting. And in fact, although it's a war story, it's about most deeply human community and human solidarity and about historical transition. Well, one way to crystallize all of this, or to summarize it, is to remind you of the complexity of the title, Grand Delusion. What could the, the, the title seems to me to have at least four separate implications, or four separate ways of un understanding. And the fact that it's, it's a measure of what I've called multiplicity or complexity, right? How, what, would, what, what would the title mean? What, what is the grand delusion to which the title refers? Well, one is surely this. Uh, remember, the film was made on the eve of World War II, even though it is ostensibly set in World War I. And in fact, uh, it was recognized as an anti-war film. It was banned in Germany and in Italy. President Roosevelt in the United States said, anyone who loves freedom should see this film. I think he was right. The title. One of the things about that war, uh, that First World War, as some of you will know, was it was identified, especially by the American president, Woodrow Wilson, as the war to end wars. So one deep, grand, but horrible illusion is that this is the war to end wars, that there won't be any more wars after this one. Right? Uh, a second possible meaning of the title is this. Um, uh, there's a, the, one of the central events in the film I haven't mentioned yet, and it's, it, it, it's maybe the most memorable interlude in the film, is after Marischal and Rosenthal make their escape from one of the prison camps, they're on the run. They can't be, they, 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 they're in Germany, and they're, it's the middle of winter. And they managed to find uh, 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 safety in the home of a, of a, of a German woman who is a, whose husband is away at the war, uh, perhaps dead. And uh, she, she is there trying to manage a farm with her young daughter, Elsie, and, uh, Elsa. And, and uh, Marischal and Rosenthal spend the winter with them. And, and, they get, and it's, a, it's an idol in the winter. So think about what, and in fact, it's very moving. And uh, again, the barriers of language are present there. At the very end of, the, of their idol in the woods, we have Marischal say to, to the child, I think her name is, I, I called her Elsa, I think it's Lottie. Um, he says, he looks at the girl, and he says, he, he try, in bad German, he says, Lottie has blau eigen. He says, blue eyes. But he's very proud of himself for having been able to articulate two German words. But the fact that he's done that is a mark of his having you know, reached out. And, and the implication, more than the implication, is he becomes the woman's lover uh, the, uh, 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 while, they're, while they spend the winter in this. And, and the German woman, uh, at a certain point, when they first take refuge in her place, the door is uh, a German soldier searching for these guys, comes to, the, comes to the door, comes to the window, and speaks to the widow, and the widow protects them. Right? So, so a second grand delusion may very well be, look, this is a very lovely story, but how believable is it? <laughs> Germans, uh, 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 French soldiers on the run from a prison camp find, find a, a farmhouse in which a German widow takes them in and protects them from the German soldiers. That would be, a, it's a nice story. <laughs> but is it a grand delusion? If it is an illusion, maybe it's a grand one, a wonderful one. Not just a large one, but a valuable one, right? So that's a second way in which the, the uh, title resonates for me. Um, um, uh, the third grand illusion has to do with the community of the prisoners, the solidarity and community that's dramatized in the film in the end. The Du Bois-Dieu character sacrifices himself for the good of the others, something that we might find surprising at first, given his distance from the other characters. Uh, um, and uh, there is a sense all the way through the film that, the, that, that a kind of community or solidarity has been established amongst the men, especially amongst the Frenchmen, uh, and especially that a kind of friendship between, uh, between Rosenthal and Marachal has been forged. Well, again. Maybe that's a grand illusion, the idea that you can transcend social class, that you can transcend the uh, ethnic uh, prejudices into which you are born and, and to which you've been, uh, 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 with, with which you've been brainwashed. So that's another kind of potential grand illusion. And then finally, the fourth example I would give, the, fir the fourth nuance that one could add to the title, the grand illusion of movies themselves. What are movies? <laughs> 
but grand illusions, right? They're two-dimensional, not three-dimensional, but when we watch them, we feel we've entered into a real world. The grand illusion of movies themselves is part of what the title alludes to. Well, something of the complexity and maturity of Renoir's vision of experience, sense of human character, and sense of history is embodied then in the complexity of the title of his movie. 